Welcome to Chiba's Visiting Lecture Series. I'm Praminda Sashtev. Uh, I'm the co-director of the Center of Healthy Brain Aging at UNSW Sydney. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which our center is located and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today, we are privileged to host Professor Dilip Jesti. Now, Dilip is a very distinguished colleague from uh, University of California, San Diego. He's in fact a pioneer of old age psychiatry in his country and internationally. He's the distinguished professor of psychiatry and neurosciences there. He's also the Estelle and Edgar Levy Memorial Chair in Aging, director of the Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research in Aging and senior associate dean for health, health aging and senior care. He's also co-director of the UC San Diego IBM Center on Artificial Intelligence for Healthy Living. Now, Dilip is a highly published author uh, with over 600 papers, and in fact, one of the world's most cited authors. He's also published 14 books, and the latest of this is titled Wiser, the Complex Personality Tray, that is the topic of today's presentation. Following the presentation, there will be a Q&A. So uh, during the meeting, during the uh, talk, please put in your questions through the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. I would like to thank you everyone for attending and I would like to welcome Professor Dilip Jeste for his talk on wisdom, aging and the pandemics. Dilip. Thank you. Good morning. I really appreciate your invitation for this uh, privileged series. Um, Professor Sajdev has been a wonderful friend and distinguished colleague for many years. And Chiba is really truly a world leader in neuroscience, having done some pioneering research in different areas relevant to neuroscience and aging. So thank you again for inviting me. Uh, let me sh share the screen. So as uh, Parminder said, I'll be talking on wisdom, aging and the pandemics. In terms of disclosure, I have no financial relationship with the pharmaceutical industry, but uh, get some royalty from books like Wiser and Positive Psychiatry. These are my colleagues, peers, staff, trainees, and these are the people who do the actual work and my job is easy, which is to give a talk. So I'm going to begin with what is wisdom? How do we define wisdom? How do we measure it? Next, I want to talk about neurobiology of wisdom. Where in the brain is wisdom located? Then comes the uh, relationship of wisdom with age. Then I want to talk about a pandemic, behavioral pandemic that, is, that has been going on for the last 20 years. There's a pandemic of loneliness. And what does wisdom have to do with it? And finally, what are the ways in which we all can become wiser can we really enhance our wisdom? So starting with uh, definition, the, cons the construct of wisdom is really centuries old. It has been there in every single religion and philosophy we can think about. Plato said thousands of years ago that wisdom alone is the science of other sciences. Sophia is the Greek goddess of wisdom. And some of you may know this, but there are more goddesses of wisdom in different religions than there are gods. So even in the heaven, there is sex difference in wisdom allocation. So wisdom has been an ancient construct and yet it has long been ignored by hard sciences. Why? Because it's a fuzzy construct. It is hard to define, they say. 
And when I first started doing research on wisdom about 15 years ago, some of my colleagues said, you know, you can do research on wisdom, but don't tell people you are doing research on wisdom because nobody will take you seriously. Wisdom is not a scientific construct. And I thought people said the same thing about several other things like consciousness. For centuries, consciousness was dismissed as a psychological and philosophical concept, not a neurobiological one. Emotion, stress. I mean, think about stress. Even today, we cannot define stress in an objective way. There is no single measure of stress. And yet, nobody questions that stress is real, it is biological, and it has a major impact on our health. Resilience was again dismissed for a long time. But today, thanks to the work of several neuroscientists, we know the molecular biology of resilience. There are animal models of resilience. And I submit that wisdom falls in the same category. The fuzzy constructs, but actually they will be defined, they are getting defined, and then they become more scientific. The good news is that empirical research on wisdom has been growing. The empirical research in this area started in the 1970s, started at Max Planck Institute in Berlin and University of Southern California uh, in Los Angeles. It has been growing. In the last decade, there were 2,000 papers on wisdom. And these are the papers you can get on PubMed, so peer-reviewed papers. However, most of this research is being done by gerontologists, psychologists, and sociologists, not by neuroscientists, not by physicians. So there is still resistance to accepting this construct in some fields of her science. So the first thing you do when you start doing research on something is to try to define it. And how do you define it? By looking at the literature. And when did the literature on wisdom start? As I said, it started in the antiquities. It started with the birth of the religions. So scriptures are really the first documentation of wisdom. I come from India and I was familiar with the Indian scripture that was thought to be, and that is still thought to be, a compendium of wisdom for life that's called Gita. So we looked at wisdom in the Gita using a mixed method, qualitative, quantitative study with a medical anthropologist as a consultant and looked at how wisdom was defined in the Gita. But of course, the criticism is that this is ancient construct and how does it apply to the world today? So we looked at the modern Western literature, as I said, the literature that started in the 1970s. And we wanted to find out what were the common elements of definition of wisdom. We found a bunch of different definitions that different people had used, and we wanted to find out what are the common elements. By the way, wisdom is a personality trait. It, it's a trait like extroversion, introversion, resilience, but it has multiple components. And that is the main question, what are the main components of wisdom? So there are six components that figure prominently in the modern wisdom definitions and also in the ancient scriptures. The most important among them is pro-social behaviors. So this is empathy, compassion, altruism. Empathy means understanding and sharing somebody's emotions or thoughts and then helping that person. Emotional regulation means control over emotions. Think about a teenager. His emotions fluctuate from hour to hour, from minute to minute. And then think about a wise older person who is calm, controlled, right? I mean, that is emotional regulation. Then comes self-reflection. There's the ability to look inwards and try to understand ourselves. You know, when something goes wrong, the first tendency is to blame somebody or something. Instead of that, think about that maybe I did something wrong and I can improve. So that is self-reflection. Then comes something which is actually sadly lacking in today's world, which is accepting 
uncertainty and diversity of perspectives where I have strong values about something, but I can understand why somebody else may have different values. I don't have to agree with that person, but I can respect their right to have different values. Then comes decisiveness, that even when you are open to diverse perspective, you have to be decisive when needed. And finally, there's a component that's somewhat controversial because not everybody accepts it as a part of wisdom, spirituality. Spirituality is different from religiosity. So an atheist can be spiritual. Spirituality means constant connectedness. You feel that you are connected with something or someone that you don't see or hear or feel. You can call that spirit, soul, consciousness, or God. So these are the components of wisdom that are common to the modern Western literature and common also to the ancient scriptures. So it is interesting to note that the basic construct of wisdom has not changed. Again, there have been some minor differences, but they are only minor. How do we measure it? Wisdom is a personality trait, as I said. And there are scales for measuring different traits. There's a scale to measure resilience, extroversion, neuroticism. So we developed a scale for measuring wisdom called San Diego Wisdom Scale. Um, Dr. Thomas is my colleague, psychologist, with expert in scale development. So he and I developed also the wisdom index. So this scale has 28 items. Each item describes a behavior. And then you have to say to what degree you agree or disagree with that on a one to five scale. We have shown that this scale has a good to excellent psychometric properties. It has already been translated into multiple languages and has been used in various studies. Examples of the items. It is important that I understand the reasons for my actions. So this is indicating self-reflection. That is important that I understand why I did something. Another item is, I have trouble thinking clearly when I'm upset. So this shows a lack of emotional regulation because it means that when I'm upset, I'm so emotionally distraught that I stop thinking logically. So there are some items that are positively worded, some are negatively worded. People often ask, what is the difference between wisdom and intelligence? Well, to have wisdom, you do need some basic intelligence. You need to have some brain integrity, no question about that. But beyond that, there is no correlation between IQ and wisdom. Some of the smartest people, some of the people with the highest IQ are not wise. Some of the mass murderers, some of the terrorists, they don't lack in IQ, they lack in wisdom. They don't have pro-social behavior and other things that are important. So wisdom overlaps with intelligence to some extent, but is quite distinct. So as I said, we found that the basic construct of wisdom was similar in scriptures and in modern world. What does it mean? To me, it meant that wisdom is biologically based. It must be based in the brain, and that is why the basic construct hasn't changed. So where in the brain is it best? How do you even find out about how, where wisdom is located? So what we did was we reviewed the literature on neurobiology of wisdom. So I did a Google search, wisdom and neurobiology. Didn't find a single study. That is because most neuroscientists don't buy the con concept of wisdom, or at least they didn't until recently. So, we went to the next step, which was looking at neurobiology of individual components of wisdom, like compassion, and their opposite, like antisocial personality. And we found there's a lot of literature, brain imaging and various other studies, looking at empathy, compassion, antisocial personality, and so on. But those were components of wisdom. What about wisdom as a whole? So there, we wanted to look at what I call experiments of nature. People who were wise to start with, 
based on the descriptions we have. But then something happened. Something happened to their brain. There was either trauma, there was either brain injury or a disease of the brain localized to specific areas that resulted in loss of wisdom. So wise person became unwise as a result of specific trauma or specific disease. And where was the trauma and where was the disease? That's what we wanted to find out. So in terms of trauma, so we went through the literature and this is not easy to do because again, people had not used the word wisdom. So we had to actually read the descriptions of those people to see if they meet, meet criteria for wisdom. And probably the most famous case in neuroscience, uh, most of you in the audience know about this person is Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was a construction worker in Vermont uh, around 1860s. Um, he was described as a nice person, smart, wise, young man who was helpful to others and so on. And then one day there was a huge explosion. This iron rod went through his skull, went through his brain. Amazingly, he survived. Actually, he had no physical injury except for blindness in that eye. And his IQ and other things didn't change either. What changed was his personality. And this is the description of Gage after his injury done by his physician. He said, Gage became fitful, irreverent, profane, impatient, obstinate, capricious, vacillating, childish, uh, with animal passions. His mind was so radically changed that people said that he was no longer the gauge they knew. So if you look at this description, it is exact antithesis of wisdom. Where was the damage? His skull was preserved. And in early 1990s, Dr. Damasio and colleagues from UCLA uh, examined his skull using brain imaging and some computerized techniques and found out that the damage to his brain was more or less restricted to prefrontal cortex. There have been a dozen such cases reported since then. They are called modern day Phineas gauges. And everywhere you find the similar areas being involved. And then there's a disease, which I think many of you probably know about this, frontotemporal dementia or FTD. What are the symptoms of FTD? Um, poor social decision-making loss of personal and social awareness, disinhibition, impulsivity, sociopathy, lack of empathy, emotional coldness, apathy, a lack of insight, self-centeredness, exact opposite of wisdom. And where is the damage? As the name suggests, it is frontotemporal and mainly the prefrontal cortex. So based on these, we published a paper on neurobiology of wisdom. And our conclusion was that two main regions of the brain are involved in different components as well as overall wisdom. Those regions are prefrontal cortex and limbic striatum. And within prefrontal cortex, some areas are more important than others. They include dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate. Insula is also involved. In terms of limbic striatum, it is ventral striatum and especially amygdala. It is interesting to note that prefrontal cortex is the newest part of the brain in evolution, whereas amygdala is the oldest part of the brain in evolution. It's really balanced between this oldest and new structure that is involved in wisdom. What does wisdom have to do with age? So like Parvinder, I came from, I come from India and like many Eastern cultures, in India, older people are respected. They're thought to be wiser. And I didn't think much of it until much later when I started doing wisdom. And I wondered whether there was actually empirical evidence to show that older people are wiser. Looking at the literature, I found a bunch of studies from all over the world that had shown that older people did better than younger ones in some ability areas. Clearly the younger people do better than older ones in terms of processing speed, uh, learning new thing, physical health in general. But 
older people are better in control of emotions, emotion regulation, positivity, favoring positive emotions and memories, making wise decisions that require experience because experience comes with age, pro-social behaviors like empathy, compassion, self-reflection. So you'll notice that these are all components of wisdom. So a number of studies have shown that older people have higher levels of this component than younger ones. A caveat here is that these are cross-sectional studies. So cross-sectional studies don't prove causality. We had just completed a longitudinal study of wisdom and um, we will soon be submitting it. But um, um, <laughs> to give you some idea, so we find that wisdom seems to increase with age up to a certain age uh, beyond which it may start declining because the neurodegeneration then takes over. It may be age of 80, 85 or could occur earlier. So why does wisdom increase with aging? Uh, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist like uh, Parminder and also another of uh, my good friends and colleagues, uh, Professor Henry Prodati. Um, I wondered the genetic psychiatrist, why do humans live so long? It doesn't make sense from the Darwinian hypothesis. Darwin's hypothesis of survival of the fittest. What he meant was that animals live only so long as they can produce babies. Because in any species, the animals die when they get old, right? They need to be replaced with babies for the species to survive. So humans are useful, so long, or animals are useful for the species so long as they can produce babies. Humans start, stop producing babies around the age of 45, 50. That's the age of menopause in women and andropause in men. So if you stop producing babies at 45, 50, how come somebody can live to age 90? The average lifespan today in the Western world exceeds 80 and before long it will be 90. So we would be spending half of our lifetime without fertility. Why does the nature allow that? Does something happen that compensates for the loss of fertility with aging? There is something called grandmother hypothesis of wisdom. What is the grandmother hypothesis? So at the top, you see a couple, their grandparents. And of course, the mothers and grandmothers are more important for the species because they are the ones who produce babies. The middle one you'll see is the adult daughter of the older couple. So if the grandma helps this adult daughter raise children, what happens? The adult daughter is happier, she lives longer, and she produces more babies than her mom did. Why? Because she has more time to do that. So the grandma cannot produce babies anymore, but she can help her daughter live longer, be happier, and be more fertile. Some of my colleagues at UCSD have described what they call the grandparent genes. These are variants of CD33 and APOE that help you live longer with better functioning heart um, and brain. In other words, these are people who are capable of grandparenting. And it is not just fertility that is transmitted or that is increased, but it is transmission of cognition cognitive and cultural values like cooperation to grandchildren. I mean, think about this, that a human can produce a baby at the age of 14 when we reach puberty, right? Yet the brain doesn't stop growing until about 21 or so. So we can't produce babies when our brain is not fully developed, right? So that means we can't take, we don't have brain to take care of ourselves, like, let alone taking care of the babies. That's where the grandparents are so critical. So that's why human species needs grandparents for its survival and thriving. 
and there are a number of studies that have shown the importance of grandparenting. Uh, this was a large study in UK, which uh, included some 1500 secondary school students. They found that when grandparents were involved in the upbringing of their grandkid, and when those kids grew up, they had fewer emotional problems, more pro-social behavior, and fewer adjustment difficulties and psychosocial problems. And this is especially true for single parent or step parent families where the risk of these problems is higher. And these kinds of intergenerational activities are helpful for both the generation. There's a study called Experience Score. This is a study funded by MacArthur Foundation and it was done mainly at Hopkins, but also other universities were involved. What they did in this study was they took some older volunteers who had retired from their jobs, people over 65 who are not working anymore. And they randomly divided them into two groups. One group agreed to spend 15 hours a week in a public elementary school. Okay, so typically these are schools in which uh, there are often kids from marginalized communities. Uh, they don't have functioning parents, let alone grandparents. Uh, so when these older people spend at least 15 hours a week with them, the kids were very happy. Their grades went through the roof, their happiness increased after one year. But importantly also, the older people, their mental health and physical health improved. Their biomarkers of stress and aging in the blood and urine improved. And the volume of hippocampus on brain MRI at the end of the study was larger in these volunteers compared to the controls who didn't do this. Now, that doesn't mean that hippocampus size increased with uh, this activity, not at all. What it means is it didn't shrink the way it did in the controls. So the bottom line is intergenerational activities are a win-win situation, helpful for both. So, so I talked about these activities, that abilities that improve with aging. How, is, how does it happen? How can anything get better with aging in the brain? Number of studies, and I know that actually Chiba researchers have contributed to this work on neuroplasticity with active aging. In people who keep themselves active physically, cognitively, socially, there is greater recruitment and more efficient utilization of neuronal networks, formation of new synapses, and even new neurons in some subcortical regions like dented gyrus of the hippocampus and periventricular area. Interestingly, there is also diminished amygdala activation with stressful stimuli or negative stimuli like regret. Of course, the caveat is that if neuroplasticity continues up to a certain age, then the neurodegeneration may take over and then it won't stop, um, it, it won't continue increasing. So, so I talked about how wisdom is a personality trait um, lo localized to specific areas of the brain, uh, although obviously, the brain is like a complex computer and different areas do connect uh, and that it seems to increase with aging. We all are familiar, of course, with the COVID-19, the pandemic, that is, um, we are still not out of it. Hopefully we are seeing the end of it, but uh, we can't be too sure. But people don't know there was another pandemic that was going on for the past 20 years. So the behavioral pandemic of loneliness, loneliness and social isolation. It's interesting, according to British historian, the word loneliness did not exist in English language until 1800. The word that existed was oneliness. That L got added around 1800 and loneliness has been increasing since then. And it has increased, especially in the last 20 years with very rapid rise in technology and very rapid globalization. Things have changed a lot. Why is loneliness a problem? Because it is a silent killer. Loneliness increases odds of mortality by 30% in 
as dangerous to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, more dangerous than mild to moderate obesity. It increases the risk of heart disease, dementia, depression, obesity, substance use. And the people at the high risk of loneliness are people with serious mental illnesses, racial ethnic minority, other marginalized groups. The good news is that loneliness is modifiable. It can be reduced, it can be prevented. Loneliness is a personality trait like wisdom. And it is partly about 50% genetically determined, which means that 50% of it is determined by environment and behavior. And some of the genes that predispose to loneliness also predispose to heart disease, metabolic diseases, depression, dementia, et cetera. So I talked about this pandemic of loneliness going on for 20 years. You can see that in the rates of suicide. Rates of suicide in the US increased by 33% from 1999 to 2017. And they went up even higher during the last year of COVID. Same thing with opioid related deaths. There are 8,000 opioid related deaths in 1999. Today, that number is 100,000. So there are things happening that are affecting the whole society. And that is, the pandemic of loneliness, social isolation, which got worse during the COVID year because of the need for social distancing. The good news is that there is, a, there is an antidote or vaccine for loneliness, and there is wisdom. We have found several studies. Actually, in several studies, we have found this trend. So what you see here on the x-axis, horizontal, is wisdom score on the vertical lonely y-axis is loneliness. People who score high on wisdom are not lonely and vice versa. And this shouldn't come as a surprise. Social connections are very special. This is a beautiful quote by Julian Holt Lundstad, an epidemiologist at uh, Brigham Young University and one of the major researchers in the field. She said that humans need others to survive. Social connection is crucial to human development, health, and survival. The evidence supporting this connection is unequivocal. There are perhaps no other factors that can have such a large impact on both the length and quality of, of life from the cradle to the grave. And our studies, empirical studies, show that. Number of st studies have shown that loneliness is associated with worse health whereas wisdom is associated with better health. We found in a number of studies, actually four different studies, including several thousand people, that higher scores of wisdom and compassion were associated with lower level of loneliness. And we just completed a longitudinal study. This paper actually was just accepted. Higher level of wisdom and compassion at baseline predicted lower loneliness seven years later. And Interestingly, there is biological support for these two things going in opposite direction. We just published an EEG study where we found that loneliness and wisdom both produce greater activity in the presence of angry emotion. However, in different, so, sorry, both presented, both. Uh, stimulated greater activity in the temporoparietal junction of the brain, but with different emotions. It was angry emotions for loneliness, happy emotions for wisdom. And there's also differential involvement of mental medium, mental striatum in loneliness versus uh, insula in wisdom. Even microbiome, you know, I think most of you know about this gut brain connection. So microbiome actually has relevance to brain health. And usually greater diversity of the microbial taxa. So there are two types of diversity, alpha diversity, which is between individuals and beta diversity, which is within an individual. Greater the diversity, the better the health, okay, in general. And what we found was that loneliness was associated with less diversity whereas wisdom was associated with greater diversity. So this associ opposite association between loneliness and wisdom is not just psychological or social, it is biological.
till the COVID pandemic, most of us at geriatric psychiatrists were worried about what's going to happen to older people's mental health. They had the highest risk of physical illnesses from COVID. They were at the highest risk of dying. They didn't have access to technology or were uncomfortable using technology. And yet, studies showed that older people faced COVID better than younger ones. The prevalence of depression, anxiety, and stress was lower in older people than younger people. Several studies, one including Laura Carstensen's study, aging was associated with higher frequency and intensity of positive emotions and lower frequency and intensity of negative emotions. A survey of 5,000 older, 5,000 US adults showed that psychopathology, like anxiety, depression, and stress, was present in 15% of older adults compared to 75% of young ones. So there's something unexpected, and I think that unexpected thing is greater wisdom and resilience in the older people. So lastly, coming to point about can we enhance wisdom? Can we enhance wisdom? I say, yes, because wisdom is a trait. And as I said, most traits are partly inherited, about 50%. That means 50% are determined by environment and behavior, and we can modify them. Wisdom may increase with aging and experience and learning, but also we know it is reduced by specific kinds of trauma and disease. That means it is modifiable. But is there evidence that wisdom can be increased? We published a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials that sought to increase a component of wisdom. And there are three components that were involved in different studies. One was pro-social behaviors, there's empathy, compassion, altruism. One was emotional regulation, and one was spirituality. And these were studies done in people with mental illnesses, physical illnesses, and those from the general population. Nearly half of the studies reported significant enhancement of that component with moderate to large effect sizes. Wow, that means that psychosocial behavioral interventions can increase a component of wisdom, at least in some people. So at least these components are modifiable. So how do we become wiser? What can we do for ourselves? What can we do with our patients? How can we help them? The first step in the process of becoming wiser is honest self-reflection. The first thing we need to do is actually find out for ourselves, which components of wisdom am I strong in? Which components of wisdom am I weak in? Because very few of us are strong in all the components, or for that matter, weak in all the components. We all have strengths, we all have limitations. So start with taking a scale for wisdom. So like our San Diego wisdom scale, which is, um, you can get it online. Uh, it's also described in our book. Uh, so you can take the scale, it takes less than 10 minutes. And you'll get your scores on each of the components of wisdom. So once you find out which components need help, then there are strategies for each of those components. Let me just give you an example of strategies for improving compassion. And compassion, by the way, is both compassion toward others and compassion toward yourself. One way is gratitude journal. Before going to bed, write a couple of things that made you feel grateful. Write a couple of things that made you feel happy that you help somebody else. Volunteering has been consistently shown to be one of the best ways of improving not just compassion and wisdom, but also your well-being. The studies that I described to you, this experience score where these seniors volunteered in schools, great example of how it helps the people you help, but also it helps yourself sense of common humanity. When somebody makes a mistake, you blame that person. 
or when you make a mistake, you blame yourself. Well, everybody makes mistakes and everybody faces major challenges. So it's okay to have that happen. Also, I have found that people, and this includes physicians, researchers, psychologists, and social workers, nurses, uh, healthcare professionals, they're very helpful and kind to others, but they're very harsh on themselves. Not a good idea. You need to be as kind to yourself as you are to others. And then finally, mindfulness. When you're undergoing severe stresses, realize that you will, you have gone through stresses before, you have survived, and you will do the same thing. And I think that's what happened during COVID. Young people had a hard time negotiating it because they had never experienced anything like that. For older people, they said, oh, we have been through things worse than that. Wars, droughts, depression, some natural disasters. And so they said, we know that we will survive this too. And they did. And some of these interventions actually may have importance for the society as a whole. And I'm almost switching my gear here in talking uh, as I come to the end of my talk from individual wisdom to societal wisdom. This was a study done in Spain, 176 teenagers. You know, we all know that right now, cyber bullying and bullying is a major, major problem. Bullying has been a problem for decades. And now the social media have made it much worse to cyber bullying. Uh, people have, young people have committed suicides because of cyber bullying. So what they did was they developed what is called Cyber Program 2.0, which included one hour session. There were 19 such group sessions, structured sessions with role playing, brainstorming, case study, guided discussions. And there was a control group. This was a randomized control trial. They found that Cyber Program 2.0 increased empathy, reduced the amount of bullying and cyber bullying compared to the control condition. So, so think about these interventions of this kind can have impact on societal behavior which is bothering so many of us. And this is my last but one slide. So as I said, the wisdom is not just individual, it affects the society as a whole. Um, and the last 20, 25 years have been stressful for most societies in the world. And I would say the last few years have been even more stressful. Gallup does uh, surveys of people all over the world every year. And their surveys clearly show that the level of stress, anger, depression, anxiety has increased 40% or more in the last 15 years. We live in a highly stressed, polarized, angry, anxious, depressed society. We just don't dislike one another, we hate each other, right? That's not good for the society's well-being, is it? And so this is what is causing the modern behavioral pandemic of loneliness, suicide, deaths of despair. But the good news is that, as I said, wisdom can and does reduce loneliness. So what we need to do is we need to teach compassion, self-reflection, acceptance of diverse perspective to children, starting with kindergarten, actually even before that. Uh, professional schools, medical schools, engineering, law schools, uh, graduate schools, businesses, and God forbid, even politicians. I mean, just imagine if all the politicians became wise, right? But seriously, I mean, there is a need for teaching people and practicing those, rewarding others, because not just because they have high IQ and they do well, in hard skills, but because they're nice to one another, they're more self-reflective, emotional regulated. We need to identify, assess, and reward these traits. If we do that, we can transform today's lonely, distressed, and polarized world into a happier, healthier, and wider society. And I'm a, an optimist. I think that this will happen. It needs to happen because we just cannot continue the way we are and we are capable of being much better. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Dilip. That was a wonderful talk. I'm sure no one will question the fact that wisdom 
is a scientific study after your talk. Let me ask you this question, of course. The, of course, science does not have monopoly on truth. And do you think the, the uh, methods used by ancient ascetics, uh, societies, which was totally reflection uh, to arrive at a truth, is that still a valid approach to the study of wisdom? I think definitely it is one of the, um, there is no single scientific method. I mean, as you pointed out, but increasingly I have become a believer in qualitative science too. And so talking to a few people and getting detailed information from them, I think it's definitely very useful. Uh, I mean, in a way, psychoanalysis was also based on that, that even long histories from individual people uh, are helpful in understanding uh, various psychological aspects. So I do think that um, what was done in the ancient times probably still holds true to some extent. But of course, now we have with the technology, the neuroscience is so much advanced. And so we can see things actually happening in the brain as they are happening. I mean, we are still far from knowing how the brain works, but we are heading in the right direction. So I think it's really a combination of methods that is going to help us. Okay, sure. Now, the other question, and I, there are a number of questions coming up in the Q&A toolbox, so I'll come to them in a moment. But let me ask you also, what is your thought that you said that, uh, I mean, the East, still there is some veneration of aging and, and older people are considered wise, but somehow in the West, that veneration to some degree has gone down. Uh, what do you think is the reason for that? What is it? Is it the family structure? Do you think is it uh, lack of power or shift of power balance from older to younger? What has happened, uh, you think, in terms of the change? Great question. I, th I think it is partly philosophical. What I find is that the Western societies are more individualistic. Uh, and there's a can-do attitude. I can change something, which is good in a way. Whereas the Eastern societies are more accepting of the nature and accepting of the fact that we don't have control over many things, we accept them. And that makes the life less stressful. So it is fatalistic in a way, it's sort of to put it badly, but on the other hand, there is much more stability, much more trust, social connections are better. Whereas when you become individualistic, the social connections break down. You are on your own, and that is helpful where you can fight things. You don't accept anything. In India, for example, when was, we were growing up, you know, when you reach the age of 50, uh, people started saying, oh, I'm getting older. I'm, you know, I'm not much useful now. Uh, my memory is going down, and I should retire. Whereas here, actually, people say even at the age of 90, no, I can still work. I can still keep my brain active. So I think both cultures have pluses and minuses. Uh, so I like the can-do attitude, but I worry about loss of social connection. So we, what we need is really some mixture. I mean, it, in a way, that's what the serenity prayer does, right? Uh, give me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. And so it's really sort of combination of the two that will help. Okay, wonderful. So there's one question about heritability of loneliness and wisdom. Question is what might be the mechanisms to inherit loneliness and wisdom? Um, again, I think this is, these are all new areas of research. So research, especially genetic research in this, in this areas are in their infancy. What is known about uh, loneliness? There is more known about genetics of loneliness than about wisdom because again, most geneticists don't study wisdom. That's a problem. But coming back to loneliness, so this study I showed you, so it, it's half a million people were included in that. And they found that loneliness was, um, it involved multiple genes. It's no, no single gene or even multiple recessive genes. But the genes associated with loneliness were also associated with heart disease, dementia, diabetes, depression. And that may explain the high morbidity and mortality that is associated with loneliness. But exact mechanism, how it does that, I don't think it is known. Um, 
Dr. Cassiopo, he was one of the, John Cassiopo, he's really one of the pioneers. And he thought actually that loneliness ha may have evolutionary value. That in the old days, when you're by yourself, you were worried because you could be eaten by some wild animal. So you really wanted some company. So you went out and sought company. So it is like hunger is useful because I go and eat and then I keep myself alive by eating because of hunger. Similarly, loneliness may have value because when I feel lonely, I go out and get some people. But when it becomes chronic, then it becomes pathological. Okay, I think that issue of the association with the ill health, the physical ill health, that's raised by uh, another questioner, Murray Kondo, and uh, says, are there any intervention programs? People who are older, who are, have probably have health problems and uh, unable to get out, how, what can they do to, in, in, to reduce loneliness, increase their wisdom? Is sure. there? Okay, we, we, we just submitted a grant to NIH for an intervention to reduce loneliness. So what you can do is actually tell the NIH reviewers to fund the grant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> seriously, uh, I, I, I do think that the, the way to uh, reduce loneliness is by increasing social connections, but not increasing social connections through social media necessarily. It needs actually your ability to enjoy connections is important. Loneliness is subjective. I feel lonely and I feel distressed. So, but if I'm alone, why do I have to feel distressed? I can be alone and I can be happy. You know, so actually if I'm alone, actually I can do something that I was, I'm not able to in the presence of other people. And so one thing that we can do in intervention is to teach people to enjoy loneliness enjoy being alone, the things they can do. So instead of getting distressed, they can be happy, they can be creative, learn new things and so on. Other thing is to improve the quality of the relationship. So you don't need 100 friends. You need one or two friends who are very close to you. And so, so those are sort of the skills we can teach through cognitive behavior therapy principles. Oh, thank you, yeah, thank you. No. Another question, I think, which is related to something you've already actually to some degree explained is a comment about people being born wise. People say, oh, he's, he was born wise. Uh, so in terms of how much can you learn wisdom uh, in a way, or especially when you are younger? I, I think um, everybody can become wiser. Socrates said, actually, that... Uh, Anybody who thinks he is wise is not a wise person because he doesn't know how much he doesn't know. But coming back, you know, I think there are kids who clearly are wiser than their age groups, right? And there are some old people who are very unwise. So wisdom doesn't automatically increase with age. And Oscar Wilde said that, you know, wisdom comes with aging, but sometimes aging comes alone. So it's a question of how you use your aging, how you use your experience to become wiser. Uh, and the children can be wise, uh, teenagers can be wise, but they don't have the experience that only comes with age, right? So a 60-year-old person is bound to have much more experience than a 16-year-old. And so to that extent, that experience would make them wiser. Yeah. So uh, one question which actually looks at the grandmother hypothesis, so to speak, yeah. So it says longevity beyond re reproductive age is a recent phenomenon, uh, perhaps, because I mean, the 20th century, I mean, if you look at say 1900 or the average life expectancy was in the 30s around the world, really. Uh, so, and, and less than 1% of our evolutionary time as a species. So how would Darwinian kin selection operate in the absence of live grandmothers among hunter-gatherers. So can you actually, in fact, uh, implicate uh, Darwinian selection for that in, of any kind, if it's just a 20th century phenomenon, really? Yeah. No, I, so uh, again, very good question. I would say that one thing we have to keep in mind is when we talk about increase in longevity, the main reason for increase in longevity for centuries has been reducing the infant mortality. 
most of the deaths occurred in very young age. In every generation, going back to the most ancient times, people have lived to age 90 and 100. That's not a new phenomenon. The number of people who live to 90 and 100 has been increasing. But people have always lived in very old ages. I mean, you know, you can read about uh, uh, most ancient periods, and there were people who lived. And those were the people who typically were either royalty or people who were rich, smart, uh, and so, so they had good social resources. But whatever it is, so every society had older people. So that's not a new phenomenon. The new phenomenon is the number is higher because of re reduction in infant mortality and mortality is during childhood. Okay. No, no, that's, that's a good point, really. Very good point. So the, the other question is uh, talking about prayer and meditation. What, what do you think that is? Does it help loneliness uh, during aging and also increase wisdom? I, I, do, I, I think so. I mean, there have been a number of studies of meditation, mindfulness that have shown that there is not only improvement in mental health, but there is actually biological effects. Uh, studies have shown, for example, on brain imaging, that the gray matter volume increases in certain area, the white matter integrity increases, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so I do think that um, things like that help. I think one sort of the easiest explanation is that if you believe in something or someone, then you sort of rationalize the world that makes you feel less helpless, that reduces the stress, it increases the well being. And increase happiness and well being clearly will improve your longevity and reduce loneliness. If you have spirituality, which means you feel constantly connected, even when you are alone, you will do much better than people who feel lonely, even when they're surrounded by 100 people. Right? I mean, the, you read about the stories about these people, you know, in this uh, um, prisoners of war in Vietnam, for example. They were totally isolated for a long time. And yet they came out and they found ways in which they could communicate with others and communicate with themselves. Sometimes some of these people in jails, for example, they learn new things, they write books. So you can, if you feel connected, you'll feel less lonely and spirituality can help that way. Thank you. So I think we we'll go to the last question because you're running out of time. Uh, so uh, talking about people with dementia, of course, lonely, they're often very lonely. Uh, and uh, uh, a question is asking about, can you teach them skills, uh, compensatory mechanisms or skills to actually deal with their loneliness? Sure. I think, again, a very good question. I should also mention that loneliness is a risk factor for dementia. Again, longitudinal studies have shown that people who are lonely have a higher risk of developing dementia. Um, so when a person has dementia, again, it depends on the stage of dementia, of course. Uh, in the early stages, and when the person starts becoming aware of memory problem, that's very hard, and depression becomes common at that stage. Loneliness increases. So absolutely uh, very good question. I think it is partly the person, but partly also the caregivers and the family and friends can help. I think you need support to that person, make the person feel wanted um, and have them do things that they enjoyed. Um, again, going back to old times and then going over old pictures, reminiscence therapy kind of thing is very helpful for reducing loneliness, keeping physically active, uh, you know, so, Whatever we can do to keep people socially engaged to the extent possible is the best thing we can do to help them. Thank you so much, really. This has been a wonderful talk, uh, Dilip. And uh, in fact, you, I think you ended with a uh, message of hope that yes, uh, there is hope for the world. The world is changing. And I think we've seen hope in the United States. I won't name a certain president, a number 45, and we move to number 46. And uh, I think that it itself shows that there is hope for the world. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you once again. 
uh, for the talk and for uh, giving your time uh, for this wonderful uh, message as well. And I also want to thank, thank all the attendees. Inviting. Yeah, thank you. Most welcome. And uh, uh, and I want to thank everybody and also want to encourage them to complete the survey that you will receive shortly. And to register for future visiting lecture series, please make sure you subscribe to Chiba's newsletter or check our website. So thank you once again and goodbye.